For the next three weeks, I am super excited to jump into this topic of uh, spiritual friendships uh, with you all. Uh, believe it or not, um, real spiritual friendships, I believe, are actually quite rare and they're quite difficult to cultivate, especially as adults. And um, even for those of us who may have grown up in church, um, it might be the case that some of us have, haven't really uh, cultivated these kinds of things before, but uh, they're totally worth it. You know, when I think of my own spiritual journey, uh, it's hard for me to think of anything else that has shaped me more profoundly than uh, some of the friendships uh, alongside, along the way uh, with my journey, uh, in my life journey. So I'm thinking of people who have mentored me, who still mentor me, people I've walked alongside me as peers, people that I mentor, uh, it's been super formative in my life. And because one of our church values here is to cultivate a deep spiritual life, one's a, one of my greatest hopes and dreams for our church is for us to be a community where we can cultivate as many of these kinds of friendships as we can. Uh, one of my hopes and dreams for this church is where this, uh, our, for our church to be a place where people, even new people can come and form these kinds of friendships and find spiritual community. And I think this is particularly crucial um, for our church right now because God's really blessed us with a lot of new friends and new families uh, over this past year. And it feels like uh, coming into this new year, we are really in the middle of this organic uh, growth trajectory in our church. Um, you, you all have seen our church budget and you know that we don't have a marketing budget, right? Um, so I'm not sure how people find us, but they do. Uh, we barely have budget to replace the, the, the janky chairs, you know, last year. And we don't have a multi-year strategic plan of church growth either, you know. I think the closest, you know, strategic plan for church growth we have is, you know, have a lot of children. Um, <laughs> And it seems to be working. And uh, you know, if we're lucky, as we were a couple of years ago, some of y'all might have twins and we'll grow even faster. Um, but people still find us. And for whatever reason, uh, many people choose and, and integrate. And, and, and we're so grateful for this. And um, because of this, one of the goals, one of the themes for this coming year for our church is this theme of enlarging the center of our community so that everyone, anyone, including those of you who've more recently joined our church, can not only find a place of belonging here, but also be invited to join at the very center of our community. As you know, our church isn't about this building. You know, it'd be kind of sad if it was, you know. Our church isn't about programming, although our programming is really improving, uh, especially when it comes to the children ministry, uh, thanks to Pastor Bede. Um, when I think about the substance of our church, it's really all about the people. It's about the relationships, it's about the friendships, it's about the trust. It's about the ways that we walk with each other, the ways that we know each other, the ways that we speak into each other's lives. It's the way that we experience Christ's presence within the context of community. And you know, one of the things that breaks my heart is when I notice certain, in my opinion, unhealthy unspoken social patterns in certain spiritual communities. For example, one pattern that I've seen uh, pretty often, which some of you may be familiar with, is this pattern where you have a spiritual community and at the center of that community is one or two really loud personalities that kind of dictate the norms for the entire rest of the community. And if you want to belong, if you want to be at the center, you're going to have to align yourself with these few people at the center. And what it comes down to is it comes down to conforming, right? And oftentimes it comes down to giving and giving and giving and conforming so that you can fit in and belong. And sometimes it's about conforming your beliefs so that everyone has the same beliefs. Sometimes it's about conforming your interests so that everyone has the same interests. Sometimes people dress similarly. Sometimes people do similar things as a living and they, people just kind of congregate together. And people are either on the inside of the circle or they're on the outside of the circle. And those who are on the outside of the circle are trying to get into the circle and uh, find their way into the circle. 
it's not, honestly not that different from middle school. And I don't want to go back to middle school. So I, I think you're, you're picking up on this, but we here at One Life City Church, we're really not into this kind of thing. You know, in fact, one of my friends who visited uh, a couple months ago uh, from another part of California, uh, he was sharing, he's like, hey, uh, you know, Dave, some, something that I find kind of unique about your church is that when I walk in, I can't tell who's in charge, you know? And every time I come, someone new is speaking up here, you know? And, um, and I'm like, you know, believe it or not, that's actually by design, right? Because we're not interested in cultivating a homogeneous community where everyone looks the same, everyone votes the same, everyone makes the same amount of income, thinks the same, comes from the same neighborhoods, and comes from the same background, think, likes the same things. You guys get what I'm trying to say. Our strength is in our diversity. And one of the ways we have to live this value out is in how we define the center of our community. It has to be defined in a way where it can expand, it's fluid, and, and it can incorporate uh, new people from all different kinds of backgrounds. So that's why we're starting these, uh, the new year here in 2024 with three weeks on this topic of spiritual friendships because we want to enlarge the center of our community. And for those of you who call our church home and are willing to uh, take the time to show up and be a part of this community, I know it's, it's tough to do it nowadays because many of us have multiple jobs, a lot of us have responsibility at home, many of us are raising young kids, a lot of us are hustling to pay rent here in California, and we want to do everything we can to honor, um, honor you because of your time commitment to show up and be part of this community. And we want to open up channels and invite you into the center. You know, we, we love our children uh, here at One Life, and they're precious, a critically important part of our community and our ministry. And we also know that building friendships when you're constantly sleep deprived and when you're constantly overwhelmed with little ones, that can be a challenge. But we want to press in and, and do our best and try nonetheless. And on the other hand, we also know that churches, unfortunately and unintentionally often, uh, have a bad history of marginalizing people who are single and people who don't have kids. And we also want to try to make our community a hospitable place where people who don't have kids can also be at the center of our community as well. So for those who don't have kids, your primary role in our church and your purpose at our church is not to babysit the, the mountains and growing mountains of wonderful and lovely and highly disruptive kids in our church that we have here. <laughs> that is the job of our high schoolers and we pay them. <laughs> and even so, we, we wanna to try to build bridges and build spiritual friendships even across intergenerational uh, divides. For those of you who are familiar with my own life journey, you might know and recall that Growing up, my family was not a super emotionally safe place to be, and to a large extent, it still isn't. And uh, I know this might be the case for many of you here as well. So like many of you, I, when I was growing up, I invested a lot of my time actually with my friends. And in many ways, I, I think it might be fair to say that my friends were my family. You know, they were the people that I spent time with, people that I trusted, people that I actually share uh, my secrets with, people that I actually share what's actually on my heart. And when I think of friendships, I think of scripture passages like Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 to 10, where it says, uh, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow and woe to him who is alone when he falls and, not ha and has not another to lift him up. When I think of friends uh, growing up, uh, one of the favorite activities we used to do is joyriding. Do people still do that? Or is that kind of what old people used to do? Yeah, it's good to ask the prices. <laughs> oh, that's true. Because <laughs> I heard young people don't like driving anymore. And anyway, um, that was not the case when I grew up. And, um, I grew up in San Jose near Cupertino, uh, Silicon Valley, but this is before Apple headquarters was headquartered there. 
this was back when San Jose was a bunch of cherry orchards, you know, and peach orchards. Um, and when I was Lydia's age, we used to sneak out of our homes at night uh, when our parents were asleep, and we'd take joy drives up into the Santa Cruz Mountains. And back in the day, cell phones were not invented yet. We all grew up in immigrant families, so none of us had beepers either, you know. And the way we would signal to each other uh, is that we couldn't send a text message. So what we would do is we'd call each other's homes, but then let it ring twice, and then we hang up. So when we hear two rings and then a stop, then that was the signal, I'm coming over, all right? <laughs> So when I hear that, then like I would wait 10 to 15 minutes and I would just wait for a flashing lights out in the street. And that was my indication that I was gonna, you know, sneak out of the window and then we'd go off on our joy ride, right? And when we were out there uh, on our joy rides, we would be up to all sorts of no good. We would TP people's houses. We would throw pies into people's mailboxes. Um, we'd steal stuff. Um, and there are these upsell score stores that had really generous return policies. So, um, so we had a whole team of us, and we would steal socks and then return them for cash. So what I would do, because I was in spiritual uh, uh, speech and debate, I would be the guy that would talk to the manager and distract everyone and just make something up. And then while they're being distracted, another guy tore out one of those, you know, those uh, uh, things that sets off the alarms, you know, and then put them all in the same place. And then another guy would actually take the goods and he wore a big jacket and he went off. And then we had another guy who had the you know, getaway car. And, um, and one time my friend forgot to take out one of the tags and the alarm went off, we had to climb fences. We don't need to get into that details. Um, and then I would leave worship the next day uh, at, a, at the church that I grew up in. Um, and then there would be other times <laughs> when we would be flying, driving up the, the Santa Cruz Mountains and we'd just share our hearts with each other. You know, we, we'd share our hopes and dreams, you know, share our disappointments, we'd share our hurts. Uh, and we talked about like, the meaning of life, we talked about our struggles with anxiety, depression. You know, a lot of our parents, uh, some of our parents were in the middle of divorce, some of our friends struggled with suicide. We talked all about all, about, uh, all of that as well. And, I, and when I look back in those moments, um, I, I learned a lot uh, in those moments about what it means to be a human, what it means to be a friend. So the point of me sharing all this with you is not just to confess my sins, because there's a lot more than that, um, and not just to make you wonder why I'm a pastor here. Sometimes I wonder that as well. Um, but rather to make the point that our friendships have the power to profoundly shape us for the better or for the worse and usually often uh, both uh, at the same time. And as I've grown older, I'm realizing that true friendships, substantial friendships, they just feel like they're harder and harder to come by. They, they, don't, they don't happen naturally or automatically anymore like they, they might have used to. And I, and I think a lot of this has to do with the nature of adult life. So, you know, hear me out here. You know, when you're back in uh, elementary school, middle school, high school, you know, college, we kind of live in a bubble uh, to a large extent where, you know, we spend most of the time at school with people our age uh, who grew up in the same neighborhood, a lot of the same interests, can relate on a lot of things. You know, if, if you grew up a nerd, you hung out with nerds and then you did nerdy stuff. If you grew up a jock, you hung out with jocks, you did jockey stuff. If you're a jerk, you hung out with other jerks, you know, and you did jerky kind of, which I hear still happens nowadays uh, from, my, from my daughters. Um, but when you finish school, suddenly everything changes. People begin to change and evolve over time. And I think the key word is that people begin to differentiate. So even though you might grow up in the same neighborhood, your, your life experiences, it all kind of takes you in different directions, right? So the older you become, the harder and harder it is to actually find other people that can relate to everything you've gone through in your life. And I would like to suggest that's okay. That's part of growing up. You know, that's part of being an adult. But if this is the case, then what are its implications on friendship and the building of friendships and what friendships look like? I'd like to suggest, you don't have to necessarily agree with me on this. Uh, I like to suggest and start with the following point. That in adult life, substantial friendships are based 
less on conformity and convenience and more on alignment, specifically on the alignment of values. So for you to be a friend with someone, a good friend with someone, it's okay that you don't agree on everything. You know, so for example, like Vivian oftentimes doesn't agree with my opinions. In fact, I would say most of the time, Vivian does not agree with my opinions. And I think that's a great thing because I am prone to dumb things and I need someone who feels comfortable to, to say that's not a good idea, right? And that actually is probably an indication that it's a strong friendship or a strong marriage, right? So, you know, some of you guys might be thinking if that's an indication of a strong marriage, you might probably have the best marriage in the world <laughs> or the best friendship in the world. Um, it's okay if someone looks different than you, right? It's okay if someone's background is different. It's okay if none of you grew up in Silicon Valley and then became an engineer and then switched careers to become a psychologist. Like, you don't need to do that to be friends with me, right? Uh, in fact, I would say most of my friendships here at church, you know, outside in other contexts outside of church, they're actually with people with vastly different backgrounds than I have. And that's one of the things I really appreciate about that. That's one of the reasons why I feel like a lot of these friendships are so rich. In fact, some of the most special moments this last year had to do with, uh, you know, spending time sharing our pain, sharing our life story. I did that with a 72-year-old Roman Catholic uh, spiritual director in Florida earlier this year. And, you know, with a Coptic Orthodox priest in Cairo, we, we talked about life and kenosis, which is a... It's, it's, idea of self-abandonment. Um, there's a professor by the name of Adam Grant, who's the professor of organizational psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. And he says this, strong relationships don't need agreement. They need alignment. Agreement is having identical opinions. Alignment is having shared values. Agreement is taking the exact same path Alignment, on the other hand, is heading the same direction. Closeness is a matter of commitment, not consensus. Let me read this one more time. Strong relationships don't need agreement. They need alignment. Agreement is having identical opinions. Alignment is having shared values. Agreement is taking the same path. Alignment is heading in the same direction. Closeness is a matter of commitment, not consensus. So friends, I like to suggest that we can have strong relationships in this church, even if we don't agree on everything, right? We can have strong friendships in this church, even if not everyone's in ministry, even if not everyone works in a nonprofit, even if not all of us are teachers, even if not all of us are medical professionals or counselors. So for the next few moments, if you're comfortable doing this, and I will only do it once, for you to discuss with a few people next to you. Um, what do you think about this, uh, what Adam Grant just said here? And what would it look like if our church was based not on conformity of opinions and conformity of paths, but rather on shared values? And if we base our spiritual friendships on shared values, what would these values be here at our church? Discuss. let's talk, go back to this topic of spiritual friendships. You know, I think a good place to start is uh, John chapter 15, which says this. This is Jesus speaking. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. And I think that the main thought um, behind um, this passage that I'd love for us to kind of allow us to sink in is this reality that God calls us his friends. We're God's friends. Jesus laid down his life for us, his friends. And so the Christian life is actually about learning to become better friends. It's about learning to be better friends with God. Learn, it's about learning how to be better friends with 
uh, one another. And conversely, if I don't know how to be good friends with my neighbor, who I can see, who's right in front of me, how can I constant, confidently assert that I know how to be a good friend with God, whom I do not see? We cannot separate our spiritual journey with our journey of learning how to be a good friend. Because chances are, if we suck at being good friends with people, you're probably going to suck at being a friend with God. So what does it mean to be a friend with Jesus? Let me close our time together this morning by sharing some examples, I think seven of them, uh, from the Gospels. And I'm just going to list them one after another. First, spiritual friendships are about spending time together, eating, drinking, walking, discussing things that were important, and also just hanging out. Uh, Luke 24, that very day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Spiritual friendships are about uh, sharing the most painful depths of our experiences when we're in those seasons of life. Uh, and Matthew 26, then he said to them, this is Jesus, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. Spiritual friendships uh, share insights and parts of ourselves that aren't disclosed to everyone right, outside the circle of friendship. Then he let the crowds left the crowds and went to the house, and his disciples said, came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the fields. He answered, the one who sows a good seed is son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. Spiritual friendships are those who humble themselves in serving one another. John 13, when he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and uh, resumed his place, he said to them, do you understand what I've done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet, for I have given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. Spiritual friendships offer emotional support, and they demonstrate genuine concern for each other's feelings. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your hearts be troubled. Let them be afraid. Jesus was attuned to other people's emotions. Jesus just doesn't say, hey, you need to know the truth. And once you know the truth, you're going to feel better. Instead, he leads with, I leave with uh, peace, I leave with you. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Spiritual friendships are loving and yet challenge each, other's, uh, each other to grow. He said to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, you... Do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing, you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. And then last, spiritual friendships involve a choice, a conscious commitment. John 15, 16, Jesus says, I chose you and appointed you um, that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask, in, ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. So here we have seven characteristics of spiritual friendships that are modeled by Jesus uh, straight from the Gospels. And since we're in a three-part series, uh, I'm going to give you guys a little bit of homework before we close for today. And the homework is, I want, I'd love for you to, to invite you to reflect on that question at the top, which says this. Given all of these characteristics of spiritual friendship, I'm sure there's more characteristics, but we'll just start with this. Given all these characteristics, from your perspective, what are the greatest challenges that keep us from forming these kinds of friendships here in Southern California in 2024? What are the unique challenges in our day that make this kind of friendship difficult, even in churches. We'll continue the conversation next week, but for now, let me land the plane with just one more thought. Uh, there was a Cistercian monk by the name of Aelred of Riveau. Uh, he lived in the 11th century, and he wrote the classic book on the topic of spiritual friendship. 
And um, when someone asked him to describe what a spiritual friendship was, this is what he had to say. He said this, here we are, you and I, and I hope a third, Christ is in our midst. And oh, would this describe the kinds of friendships and relationships in our church presently and the ones that are to be built in the coming months and years. Let's pray. Father, we pray that uh, despite all the challenges that stand in our way of forming this kind of connection, forming these kinds of friendships, would you give us the courage, would you give us the commitment, would you give us the grace, the mercy, would you give us the wisdom to be able to uh, step forward and be a part and participate and cultivate these kinds of friendships um, where uh, we uh, learn to love one another uh, as Christ loved us and with you uh, at the center of these friendships. And Lord, would you uh, show us how we can uh, be a community that models this, that lives this, that embodies this, and um, would you open up channels um, for us to uh, learn how to become better friends with you and better friends with each other. And in so doing, uh, follow, follow you and be, uh, be more faithful and mature disciples of you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.